Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about love and intimate relationships. To open up, the book asks the question, what is love? Well, let's talk about 10,000 years of philosophy and human history and human experience. And has anyone actually answered that question successfully? The answer is no. Of course, what love is, is completely arbitrary. And whether or not love in itself is a human conceptualization, something that we socially constructed to account for a range of biopsycho processes to account for how we're feeling about someone. I mean, you know, it's a big debate. But then again, is love a biological process? You know, is that being attached and caring for and having empathy for? Is that part of our genetics? So again, when we're asking the question of what is love, of course, we're taking a biopsychosocial approach as we do with everything. And I wish that we could kind of completely move on from anatomy and physiology at this point in this class. But again, it all comes back to basic body and brain structures. Then the way you think, how you interpret your feelings, your motivations, and then the social context and how that structures the way you think, the words you choose to label your feelings, etc. Again, it's all complex. When you study emotions, for example, emotions aren't just like separate things from each other. Emotions are neurons releasing neurotransmitters, your brain communicating, okay? But it's different, you know, pathways of neurons releasing neurotransmitters that account for different emotions. For example, for example, are there overlaps, you know, in the brain structures and areas of the brain when you're feeling anger and love? And what you're going to find is there are overlaps, right? And so when you study emotional theory, emotions are really just specific types of blendings of neurons, releasing neurotransmitters that make us feel in certain ways. And then the emotional words themselves are words that we socially construct to label these feelings, okay? But again, what you're feeling is not only a biological process of neurons releasing neurotransmitters in specific ways, it's also based upon how you are coping with situations, your perceptions, the way you're thinking about things, your take on something, for example. And then your feelings are also molded by the social context because you learn through social interaction what's the proper way to express things how should i express these emotions these feelings like grief sadness happiness love joy whatever words you want to apply to it and again so these words themselves are really just words that humans to construct to account for our experiences of some phenomena or some range of emotions that we're feeling or whatever it might be so again, to open up, your book talks about the basic chemistry that could be associated with love, for example. And it says things like neurotransmitters, again, neurons release neurotransmitters chemicals, okay? These chemicals cross the synapse and interact with the dendrites, you know, etc. <clears throat> neurotransmitters allow brain cells to communicate one with each other. So what's going on when you're feeling these feelings of love, for example, is it simply just a release of norepinephrine or dopamine or phenylethylamine? <laughs> phenylethylamine. Those words every time. I don't know how the biological doctors do it. I'm just so impressed. Who even comes up with all this? I need to know Latin for half of these things. But again, as I was talking about with like sexual arousal and things along those lines, you have neurotransmitters releasing neurotrans, you know, releasing, or I'm sorry, neurons releasing neurotransmitters in the form of things like oxytocin or dopamine. And again, that feeling of love, that connection of bonding, you know, how much of that's just releases of dopamine, that ecstasy you're feeling, that happiness, how much of it's the oxytocin, that feeling close to someone, that bonding effect. Your book says that when you get into these romantic relationships though, and even I think this would actually totally occur with like best friends and other moments in your life where you're having this new excitement, whatever it might be. But again, when you start to get into these, since we're in psychology of sexuality, I'll try to narrow it down. When we get into these sexual based relationships, you know how it is in those early times in your relationships, right? 
all of a sudden you're all like excited, giddy, you're in this euphoric phase, blah, 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 blah. Your book literally says that these neurotransmitters releasing, or I'm sorry, the neurons releasing neurotransmitters really produces an amphetamine-like effect. It pumps you up. However, then it gets deeper and says over time with relationships, this you kind of develop a tolerance to these releases. And so that high that you've been experiencing when you first meet someone, it kind of goes away over time. But then a real question is, does it go away or is it really just changing? And so your book asks the question of, is passionate love or sexual romantic love transitory? Does it have phases? When we're getting into these long-term relationships, does it start out with that super pumped up, crazy neurotransmitters releasing, and then all of a sudden you kind of develop a tolerance to it, and then it doesn't have the same effect, and then you're kind of bored with that person? Or do other things kick in? And so your book talks about long-term relationships where endorphins kick in to produce a morphine-like pain-blunting chemicals that produce a sense of euphoria, security, tranquility, and peace. And so you have to ask some questions here because, again, it's hard to even really know where to start with this lecture because there's so much here that I would like to address. Your book doesn't get into the association between love and sexuality yet. It's just introducing in this chapter the idea of love-based relationships, okay? And so, again, is love-based relationships a basic form or a stimuli toward getting involved in passionate relationships? And if you study like 10,000 years of human history, historically humans were not monogamous people. We were polyamorous people. And it could be one male with a few females it could be you know in any different way and one male with a couple one um uh, you know and so depending on the type polyamorousness is the typical throughout human history way of being now in this western society and maybe we're growing up the cultural standard of the cultural norm might be monogamy but again, if you look at pre-human history going all the way back, polygamy, or not polygamy, I guess that's marriage, so polyamory, you know, is the most common form. And even in like the United States in modern times, you still have, maybe it's not, I mean, poly, you know, having multiple partners at once or even everyone dating at once is quite normal in modern times. But, you know, just the idea that we're, you know, people tend to be with multiple people is, you know, also something that's a little bit new. So again, if we were to look at relation types throughout human history, again, I teach marriage and family. And when you teach a marriage and family class, you have to go deep into it. But just to give you a quick overview, again, you have this prehistory of just humans, you know, just kind of being poly and, you know, then you have a like, you know, civilization arises, we start socially constructing things like marriages, and then we create legally supported marriages. And then we go through this phase for a while where marriages and relationships are more like economic transactions. It wasn't about love. And then when you really start to study love, where the idea of love comes about actually comes during um, like the Industrial Revolution, when people left their farms. When they left the farms, they no longer had an attachment to these large property estates or whatever it might be that they needed to have some kind of a transaction through marriage to account for whatever. People were just living in the city and doing their jobs, and so it didn't really matter so much who they married. So here you start to get into this idea of picking who you marry and having the freedom to kind of choose your suitor or whatever it might be. And then you get into the fun Victorian era again. like and Then so you start to get into this like formalized dating, like so... Like back in the day on the prairie, you know, the suitor would come and spend the night at the foot of the parents' bed. And like, it's just silly traditions like that going all the way back. Or the, again, the suitor idea that comes, I was thinking about the Glass Menagerie, the Tennessee Williams play, where the girl is never, no suitor ever comes a calling, you know, and she's basically going to become an old cat woman, you know. And, and so again, our, our, Things have shifted. And then, like, you go to the 1940s, 50s, etc., and, like, everyone pretty much got married at 18 because you weren't really allowed to have sex before marriage, and then people were having babies younger. And now you get into this modern time where people are absolutely waiting to have babies, waiting to get married, 
half of adults right now aren't even married. And so again, you have to look at all these cultural structural foundations of love and relationships. And again, it gets powerful because there's all these social changes. But then you have to look at the biology of it all. What is driving us to get into these relationships in the first place? Our human nature, in our DNA, we want to be social. We want to interact with each other. We form relationships. We work in groups. Okay? So again, in our body releases hormones that tells us we want sex, for example. And so we're driven to interact with people, socialize, work together, form relationships that are friendships, some are sexual relationships. But we also have things like jealousy built into us. So there is also this structuring of relationships built into us and in that maybe humans can be possessive. And even though we might be slightly poly, are we also territorial and possessive? And so again, you can go deeper into anatomy, like after a man has sex, there are certain neurotransmitters that are released that makes that man feel territorial. Yes, the serotonin kicks in and reduces our sex drive and makes us more complacent, but that doesn't mean we're not going to then go protect what we just inseminated. That sounds awful. But again, if you think about it from like an evolutionary, psychological, biological position, maybe the idea of forming monogamous relationships and having these poly or serial dating or multiple partners throughout a lifetime or multiple partners at the same time, maybe all of those potentials are built into us. And then again, you ask the question of, is it love that humans seek? Or is it just that commitment that humans seek? Is, you know, why do we form these relationships? And the book says things like girls seek out love more than boys. But then it says over time, that's starting to balance out. So again, do boys and girls both seek relationships? Do we seek long-term relationships, short-term relationships? This, again, is where I'm saying we could go off for days on these subjects. And so I'm just breaching some of these ideas for you to get you thinking. But again, I have studied like the, uh, you know, the biological processes. When you look at people that are with multiple people across a lifetime or when someone's with one person over a long, long a lifetime, and you find that having a person or maybe many people over a lifetime is associated with these endorphins kicking in. So yes, when we first meet people, we do get that rush. Then you get to know them. It becomes more familiar. You're just like, okay. But again, once you hit that comfort phase, what happens in that comfort phase? Why do we stay with people for a lifetime? And so again, how much in our biology is driving us to form lifetime partnerships, which is very interesting. How much of the way we think, like we're told our whole life, you're supposed to find a soulmate. I better go find one. You're not supposed to get divorced. That's a taboo, right? You hear these socialized, culturalized norms and you internalize them. But again, you know, how much of that thinking is associated with it? And then how much of the social context, like structuring marriage, structuring legal marriage, um, you know, these cultural norms that are created in the cultural context, how much of that influences our behavior. And so again, as I'm saying with all these classes, we know a little bit about this, but we don't know everything. It's not like we can pinpoint every single neural pathway that and then map it out. Like I wish we could just put iodine in our brain and just trace everything, but we just don't have the right instruments to really do that yet. But we can see where these parts of your brain are going off and we can see these areas and we know things are happening. So again, I'm just introducing you to some of this. When we go to ask what of love, again, it sounds simple. You're like, it's just some feeling I have for someone. But when you study emotions, emotions themselves are not simple. It's a biopsychosocial process of all these neurotransmitters going flying around your brain and then you thinking about stuff and reflecting and stuff and then the social context that influences you. So again, it's all very complex, brilliantly so, and I love it. And again, if we look at the philosophy of love and romance and poetry and all the things that we express and how we express our love and yada, 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 we'd be here all day. I really thought this was going to be one of my shorter lectures. But again, once you start opening up this Pandora's box, it's wild. So let's just know that neurotransmitters are at play here. You have these chemicals in your brain. 
that make you feel good and that drive you to seek out those rewards, okay? You seek out sexual friends, all of these relationships because your brain wants you to, your body wants you to. Otherwise, it wouldn't have these reward systems built in. Again, it's like classical conditioning. Once you experience something positive, you want that reward. So you keep pressing the button over and over and over again until you get rewards. I mean, sound about right? But then again, the way you think about what's acceptable, how should I pursue relationships? What's cool? When am I allowed to have sex? Do I wait for the first date, the third date? Is it like three months these days? Is it when we're married? How long should I be with someone? You know, in modern times, I've been hearing this three month rule with the new, you know, the kids these days, they're like three months. And I'm like, okay, we had three months. Okay, that's where we're at. You know, I'm just trying to figure it out what's the patterns in modern times. It's all complex. But to skip through some of this, your book gets into the types of love. And it breaks it first into just two categories. One, those that you're romantic, passionate with, engaging in sexual relationship, and then basically all the other loving relationships like your best friends, your grandmother, your cat, whatever that might be, okay? Now, within these two basic broad categories, you have your triangular theory of love, which tries to get at some of the components of love, okay? And so it looks at it like types of relationships. If you are passionate, you know, having that sexual thing, you're intimate, you're sharing things with each other, and you've committed, you've had the talk, that's like a romantic, loving partnership. Let's say you have the intimacy and the commitment, but you don't have the passion because you're not having sex. That's like your best friend, you know what I mean? Like, you share everything with them, you've had the talk, you know your friends for life, BFFs. But you're not, you know, you're not engaging in sexual intercourse. <laughs> and then you have like your work people, right? Like you're committed to working the job together. You might be committed to a basic friendship, you know, your acquaintances, but you don't really share everything with them and you're not also banging them. You know what I mean? And then there's another theory that gets into the styles of loving as um, romantic loving, game playing loving, possessive, compassionate, uh, companionate altruistic and pragmatic what type of you look around you do you have the hopeless romantics in your life do you like the ones that just like to poke the boys and play with them and get them to chase them are you the possessive jealous type that doesn't want anybody else being with your person are you like just the best friend that's so supportive and makes the birthdays great are you the one who gives up everything you have for that person or are you just a realist who are you and again you're probably a bunch of these. And again, there's probably more categories. I've never been a big fan of like trying to map out all these feelings into like one theory. But again, these are some great introductions to some categories we can consider. And then of course you have the not very well theoretically supported five love languages that's always in the pop culture, breaking it down to receiving gifts, quality of time, words of affirmation, acts of service, and physical touch. But again, if you just look at human relationships in general, how do we think about love? How do we express love? How do we experience love? It's very complex. It's broad, okay? Again, you have physiological responses when you're in love with something. Here might be a good time to, again, revert back to who do you love and why do you love them? Okay, so again, in your biology, yes, you're driven to form connections and you get these neurotransmitters. But another question is things like, what are you actually attracted to? What you're attracted to, again, is a, in, in its origin, a physiological process. You don't get sexually aroused from rocks. You probably don't get sexually aroused even when you ate like a cake that is so orgasmic or just ice cream that you're like, oh my God, this is just, oh, I'm having all of these sensations right now. Is that enough to create orgasm? Again, your prefrontal cortex can tell your body to have orgasms. And yes, your brain can literally tell your body to have orgasms without physical stimulation. But the likelihood of that occurring over ice cream is, I would say, very little. But what there are things that you are sexually attracted to that is built into your biology. And most of that, I mean, can you really control or even help some of those aspects of what you love or what you're attracted to? And it's kind of like 
you know, forcing people to conform to a heteronormative or heterosexuality. Some people just don't feel it. They don't have the physical responses to certain things. And again, that is just so much that's built into our biology. Yes, we can try to think ourselves into being aroused. And yes, we can kind of think we're supposed to conform because of the culture that's trying to tell me I'm this way. But what, are you, you know, what if you're not feeling it? What if you feel it for something else that maybe deviates from cultural norms? Again, here we should say, look, humans are capable of a great many things. So we need laws against pedophilia, elder abuse. I mean, there's so many things. Animals like humans will, you know, a lot of human sexual behavior should, I'm not going to have opinions, but be labeled culturally taboo. I'm going to have opinions on those subjects for sure. The hell could they? I avoid opinions like the plague. But yes, we need laws to protect people from some things that cause incredible harm that really deviate from you know positive interactions in a group environment but again things that don't cause harm like you know homosexuality that's just you know if I, i'm assuming you know if you identify as homosexual you feel that like i mean again you can't like how much of that is just your biology you just can't you don't control over that you know and some people wish they could. I've read so much of that. and read so much qualitative research on that. And they'll try out, you know, maybe a gay man will try dating a girl because they think that's what they're supposed to. And they just, you know, they just, it's just not happening. Or they're uncomfortable in that situation because that's not who they are. <laughs> so we have to, we have to accept that. So again, but why do we fall in love? And again, so... Again, how much of that's biology? All those neurotransmitters, you know, all your oxytocin, dopamine, all these things that make us feel close and comfortable. Okay, but then how much of that's just you thinking about it? Like, you know, thinking about that person and reflecting and like, ooh, I like them. I like everything they do. I can't get enough of them. I want to just keep touching their face as much as I can, you know? And then how much of that's the social context? So your book starts to look at things like, what is, I mean, honestly, though, the number one thing associated with who you end up with, if you end up with someone, tends to be proximity. Are you close to them? Okay. I mean, it's superficial, but usually it's like within five miles. I mean, but again, it makes sense because if they don't live next to you, how are you ever going to meet them in the first place to create a relationship, right? So again, are we all searching for our soulmates if the number one thing associated with who we hook up with is proximity? All right. So again, I love ideas like soulmates, but again, you know, how much of that's just socially constructed, non-pragmatic, you know, hopeless romantic kind of stuff, right? Because, I mean, who really is just with one person in modern times in the United States? We can look at some research on that. Okay, we should. Let's look. I need, I'm not out of time. I'm not going to pull up the statistics right now. But yes, of course, we have surveyed that. Uh, also, familiarity. Do you guys share a common culture, common socioeconomic status? Are you guys exposed to each other? Are you guys in similar places? Again, are you similar to each other? Do you have the same likes and dislikes? And, you know, uh, race, ethnicity has always been a huge factor. Again, race has always been associated with who you marry. But now you're starting to see one in 10 of all marriages in the United States are interracial. So again, in, eight, in uh, 1980s, there were only about 400,000 interracial marriages. Now they're over 20 million, but still only one in 10. What does that tell you? So again, race is still associated with who we marry. Uh, whites, 90%, blacks, 90% tend to marry the same race. Hispanics and Asians, it's around 26%. And again, if you go deeper into stigma against which interracial marriage is more acceptable in America, you would find that, you know, white with Hispanic or black with Asian or white with Asian or black with Hispanic historically has been more appropriate than white with black for, again, an entire many centuries of, you know, racialized stigma and the origin of racialized stigma along the black-white axis in America. Again, watch, take, watch my videos on race and ethnicity. I teach whole classes on this. But again, things like race, how rich your parents are, you know, how rich those people are. Do you guys share common wealth, religion, you know? Uh, do you like the same movies? Whatever it might be. Uh, reciprocity, is it a good exchange? You know, you can apply exchange theory here and be like, how does it work with relationships? And then, of course, our superficial physical attractiveness 
I put up here, I'm again a biopsychosocial process. You guys watched an earlier video for an assignment in this class that got into some of this. Like, are we, you know, are, genetically built into our biology, are we more attracted to things like youth and, you know, looking at vitality and do they look diseased? <laughs> Just little things like this, right? And age is a factor, you know? And why? And again, that lecture that you guys talk about looks at the things like since men's sperm can tend to last longer than women can have babies, women aren't as picky about men's age as men are about age and how much of that's superficial, how much that's built into our biology. Again, is some really good debates to be having. But again, what attracts you? And again, your book talks about like, you know, physically attractive people having more friends and better social life. But how much of that's just simple confidence because of stigmas that we place against on beauty and things along those lines. So again, I like to go look at that biopsychosocial. What turns you on? What excites you? That, you know, your body kind of knows what it wants and what it doesn't want. Listen to that. And then your brain, you know, you're looking at what you're told you're supposed to be dating your whole life or whatever. But is that really what you're attracted to? Because again, we learn through culture what beauty means. We learn by interacting in the social context what we should be attracted to. We, you know, what smells, what sights, so much of that is just learned. So again, it's good to weed through how you actually physically feel. What actually does it to you? And then weed through your thoughts about stuff and how are you feeling and reflect upon what's going on. And then also look at the social context and question our standards of beauty and how we're supposed to be and just ask yourself what actually makes me happy. So love and attachment styles. I'm There's a lot of good research on this. I've done a ton of research on this. But if you get your intro to psychology or developmental psychology or whatever is going to go deep into attachment styles, right? You have your secure attachment styles where you're fine, you can be off, you don't have to be next to them all the time, but you like being with them and you're happy with, with them and you have good positive reactions. Then you have your anxious, ambivalent person who's like wants to be with people but doesn't really think anybody wants to be with them and hesitates. And then you have your avoidant style, which is, you know, all of those negative things that you could bring up. And so, again, what I really want to focus on with this, though, why I introduced it is you know, we think as kids that once we grow up, we're adults, like we don't need anyone anymore, right? We don't need an attachment. But what you find is your attachments go in like three phases. You got your parents and maybe your siblings, some close people in your family. Then that attachment kind of moves on to your friends and your peers once you hit that middle school and the high school, college age. And then you start hooking up and all of a sudden that significant other, that becomes that attachment. So it's you know, throughout life, we don't lose our need to be with people. Again, it's just that that relationship is, as we talked about earlier, transitory. It, it just changes and shifts over time. And our needs from these people also change and shift over time as we go through different phases in our life. You know, when we're young, we really need someone. Then we get middle-aged and it's more like we're taking care of people. Then when we're old, it's like, now we need people really again. <laughs> so it's like... You know, we go through these phases in our life. But in the end, we're human. We have to be with people. We need to interact. It's in our biology. It's in our DNA. And whether it is we're seeking out love or if it's just we're seeking out attachment to get the brain rewards. But again, when you experience that attachment, those feelings toward each other, and you all are sharing life together, that's you get the brain rewards. That's why you keep seeking it out. Our body, our brain, it wants us to talk to other people. It wants us to be with others. Issues in relationships. I don't want to introduce it too deep now because we're going to get a little bit uh, deeper into this. And you know, But this has so many broad ranges. So again, that's why I don't want to go too deep. But here, depending upon what you're studying, for example, maybe you're going into counseling. If you're going into counseling, you're going to have a lot of this. And it's all types of relationships. This lecture might be focusing on more like romantic, sexual, intimate partner relationships. But again, relationships with parents and kids, with the workplace, whatever it might be. You're going to encounter this when you're in counseling because people struggle with relationships in all areas of their life. 
But think about loving relationships and what couples might struggle through. Again, you have that initial euphoria. Then you start to settle in. Then where are you? And so here you can look at things like relationship building. Are you building relationships? Are you constantly growing? Has your relationship hit a stagnant area? Are you at that point where you just don't like each other anymore and you're looking for a divorce? And then there are other problems like domestic violence or super jealous possessiveness or whatever conflicts you can imagine coming up in a relationship, that is this section. And again, I can't spend days is because you guys will lose it and plus it doesn't really introduce all this in your book right yet. But again, think about problems and relationships and you can look at it from even applying things like the triangular theory of love. How are you with your intimacy? Are you sharing? Are you caring? Are you spending time with each other? Where are you with your commitment? Are you guys like maintaining that and, you know, you know, asking questions of where are you? Or are you cheating on each other and completely breaking that? And then think about things like your romantic or your sexual life. Where is that at? Is it where you want it to be? And you can even here apply things like cognitive dissonance. Does your reality meet your expectations? And so again, that disparity between your reality and your expectations then creates things like anxiety, depression, all of those problems, you know, that can come from that. And so again, when we're looking at issues in relationships, it's very broad. It can just be all types of conflict. But your book does introduce things like love versus sex. You know, like, have you guys had the talk? Is your relationship defined? Is it specifically a sexual relationship? Is it more than that? Which sex does it matter to the most? Not even to get into that here. <laughs> Types of sexual encounters and relationships, cultural structuring of scripts and norms, um, risk of disease, psychological effects of interactions and perceptions. Your book, there's all kinds of stuff here. But again, I just challenge you to think, what are the challenges that we might experience in relationships? And if these people want to maintain that relationship, what can we do to help support that? And then when people are in very problematic you know, relationships like domestic violence, do we need social policies and things to address that? Um, and so again, very broad, but I just, again, that's why we're just gonna fly through that section because again, we would be here for days and days and days. Maintaining relationship satisfaction, I was joking about this with my intro to sociology class the other day because I was teaching research methods, which bores the heck out of them. And then I was talking about like, but again, why is it important to go out and study things like relationships? Like, why does that even matter? Why should we study positive and unsuccessful relationships to see what's up? Because again, maybe it can help. Maybe just for the sake of knowledge, maybe to apply this knowledge, maybe to use this in a counseling setting. Maybe each one of these things I'm about to mention are things that we can work on to make our relationships better. But your book talks about open, honest, and supportive communication, the ability to confront tough subjects and have the tough conversations, be friends as well as lovers, have positive interactions. Think about what is best for you. Again, you might be told this your whole life. This is the way you're supposed to spend your life. This is how your relationship should be. But does that work for you? What works for you? So again, adjust your expectations to meet reality. And again, the idea, can you make reality awesome? Can you build the life that you want if you're not living it? Um, your book also introduces the importance of sexual communication. And again, depending upon the cultural norms, talking about sexuality can be absolutely taboo. Again, where is this even appropriate? Is it appropriate? Are we kind of a prude culture in general in America where in France they're more open and you might see nudity in a magazine, but in America you have to be 18 and over and everything's highly restricted. Okay, so there's some big differences here. But the importance of sexual communication. Why might you know sexual communication be important? Well, what about divorce? How many divorces are associated with not being close with each other? All of a sudden you're not having sex anymore. All of a sudden, you're not getting the brain rewards anymore. All of a sudden, you're miserable, and here you are. So again, why is it important to talk about sex? You can increase closeness and satisfaction. You know, have the uncomfortable conversation. Sometimes it's super awkward. I mean, you're talking about intimate things that might make you feel shy, things that might we might culturally think are private, you know, whatever it might be. But again, 
Can you learn about each other's wants and needs? Can that improve the situation? Can you get what you want out of the relationship more? Okay, thinking about mutual empathy, communication strategies, reading about and stuff and things you might want to do and discussing it. I've heard, you know, some suggestions from sex therapists like once a month. Just sit down and talk about sex once a month. How are we doing? Are we where we want to be? Can we improve that? But again, your book also gets into, well, how do you deal with that? Like common complaints. Like what if someone is complaining like I'm not getting enough sex in my relationships? And then how do you talk about that without having your feelings hurt and then having a giant fight, you know? Uh, learning to share, learning to listen, using eye contact, giving feedback, having positive regard. Positive regard meaning like looking at them in a good way. Thinking of them positively, not focusing on the negative. Ask questions and discuss preferences. And again, that could be super awkward because people might be into things. And they might be scared to talk about it. And because they're scared to talk to it, now they're repressing a bunch of stuff, which is then creating anxiety, etc. So how do you get comfortable enough to be able to talk about these things? Again, uh, gain permission, make requests, express and receive complaints. And again, how do you take it? Like, what are you going to do? Like, if you're in a situation where, you know, the sex life, it's not where you want it to be, you know, and then you're looking at the problems and then, you know, can you get to the solutions without freaking out? <laughs> Choose the right place and time to have the conversation. Your book also talks about nonverbal sexual communication, such as for, uh, facial expressions, uh, personal space, touching, sounds. And then uh, to wrap it up, your book discusses communication patterns in unsuccessful and, unsu in, uh, successful and unsuccessful relationships. And it looks at things like leveling and editing. How do we level the playing field? And just get to a place where we can actually talk about stuff. And maybe question some of the things that we're saying and maybe rewrite it to say it in a more positive way. How do we validate the people we're with? How do we avoid having volatile, harsh dialogue where we're fighting? How do we avoid criticizing but having positive feedback, you know? <laughs> How do we avoid contempt for each other, defensiveness for each other, stonewalling, being belligerent? Okay, so again, think about issues in relationships. Think about things that avoid issues in relationships how do we have good positive relationships how can we avoid when we're freaking out and fighting in the car how do we avoid yelling in front of our kids everyone who's ever had relationships have struggled at times but again if we're always asking myself why or not myself ourselves why are we in this why are we doing this you know that'll answer a lot of questions but again, do we have the pressure to stay with people? Why do we stay with people? Again, these are unanswered questions and it varies for each person and it varies for each culture. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's all very arbitrary. The only thing we know for sure is that we are driven by our biology to interact with each other. And sometimes that interaction leads to sexual interactions. And sometimes we form relationships. Sometimes those are friendships. Sometimes those are just working relationships. Sometimes those are loving relationships. Sometimes they're all three, you know, and again, so it's very complex. So again, that biopsychosocial approach to love, what is love? Is love an emotion? What are emotions? And again, you have to get into the neuroscience of emotions. I guess for psychologists, this is a psychology class. You need to study these processes to understand what it is people are feeling in the first place. Because when you're talking about words like feelings, what does that even mean, feelings? Is it just thoughts, cognitions, or is it physiological processes? Is it a blend of both? Where do these feeling words come from? They're socially constructed. We have to interact in the world to learn the words in the first place to account for or categorize our feelings. <laughs> so, y'all, thank you so much. I'm just, there's so much here that we could go on for days. I've tried to keep it as short as possible so that you guys don't lose your absolute minds. But hopefully I've introduced you to some cool ideas, get you thinking about some stuff, and y'all have a wonderful week.